Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Church of Northwest Arkansas. Our time together to dig into the word, to worship, to take communion, to pray together. We're really glad you're watching us. Hey, good this morning, morning, everyone. Quick announcements as we get started. Have your communion elements ready. Um, we'll take communion together towards the end of the service. And we want to do that. So take time to gather those so that you're ready when we do that. Also, there's a link in the side that if you want to join the service uh, on the Zoom link, um, instead of watching it on Facebook Live, we can see your face, you can see us in a different way, because we're also going to stay on that link afterwards and just hang out. So maybe even you watch it on Facebook and then you jump on the Zoom link after uh, during that final part of worship and communion. Um, that'd be a great time to, to get to see each other. So let me pray for us as we start this morning. Just take a minute and take an inhale and exhale. Bring yourself here to this moment, to the word, to what the Holy Spirit wants to say today. God, thank you for gathering us across time, across geography, We're grateful that you transcend the barriers that keep us apart right now. And not just externally, but internally as well, that you knit us together as one body, one people. We who were apart and isolated, lost and separated have been joined together into your body by your Holy Spirit. And God, we ask that you speak to us collectively and individually today through your word, through the spirit, through the worship. And you would draw each of us and all of us closer to you, closer to our true selves and closer to each other. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning, Grace Church. Uh, so good to be here with you this morning. As usual, we're doing things a little different and mixing up the uh, location. Alex and I are here um, distance out at um, 2828 uh, to kick off worship this morning. And the first song that we're going to be doing is straight from the text that you'll be hearing from John here in a couple minutes um, from Isaiah 6. Um, it's actually from when Todd Agnew was put to um, music. And so we'll be singing a little bit of the text before John jumps in. So sing with us here, um, Isaiah 6. Da 
Hey, welcome again, everybody. We're really glad, a special welcome to everyone who's listening on the podcast, wherever you are. Uh, we're really glad you're with us. And, uh, you know, don't worry about that whole like, comment, share thing. We're really not into that too much on our podcast. But uh, if you want to drop a note, 
and just tell us, hey, I was listening to your podcast and I thought it was awesome. That'd be great. Or just drop a note and say, hey, Stacy Bell is doing a wonderful job coordinating all this tech. That would be even more awesomer. But anyway, we're really glad you're here with us um, this morning. So it's been quite a week, quite a couple of weeks, huh, everybody? Um, January 3rd, Pete Meyer was sworn in as a freshman Republican congressman from Michigan. He ran for office after serving a tour of duty in Iraq and serving in NGOs overseas, trying to help people. He came in, as many members do of Congress, wanting to work for the good of people, eager to make his mark as an elected official. And just three days later, on January 6th, we all saw what happened in our country's capital. I don't have to recite the details now or here, but I think it's safe to say it is not what Congressman Meyer or any other member of Congress signed up for when they ran for office in the first place. To come in ready to work for the people and in just a few days, being chased by a riotous, bloodthirsty crowd can cause a serious re-examination of what you signed up for. Well, what about us? What are our expectations when we respond to God's call and grace towards us? Now, I'm not saying God is going to purposely cause chaos in response to our yes, but so many times we're invited into situations that look nothing like we imagined they would look when we first signed up for them. And we see this in Isaiah for sure. Now, those of you who are just joining us, we're studying this book of Isaiah. It's a long book, and it's an important book. Read it. And get the commentary. We can't do every verse. We just don't have time for that, but we'll, we'll hit the highlights. But you need to read every word. Read all the verses. Um, Keep up with it. Um, It's going to take intention and commitment, but believe me, it'll be worth it. So let's just take a minute, another minute, and pray here as we start today. And God, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to wisely discern, and hearts to love and obey what you show us through your word, through your spirit, and through your church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting with chapter six. Actually, we're only going to do one chapter. We did five chapters last week, kind of the, we called it the overture of Isaiah. It gave us a kind of a broad outlook of what's going to happen, what we're going to encounter. Now we get, we get very specific this week, chapter six. So we're going to look at chapter six this week, starting with verse one. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on a high elevated throne. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Now let's pause there for a minute. This is approximately 740 BC. This is 140 years before Israel is carried off into captivity in Babylon. So so we need to mark this. This is the long suffering of God. This, This is God doesn't just spring judgment on us. Never does that happen. There is always extended periods of warning, of calling people back, of inviting people to repentance. Um, And here we see this starts 140 years before ultimately um, judgment is going to be exercised and the people are going to be carried off to Babylon. Now, Uzziah, who's mentioned here, was one of the longest ruling rulers in Israel's history. For over 50 years, he either ruled directly or co-ruled with either his father at the first or one of his sons at the end. And he started off as a really good king, a really good and righteous king. But as we read his story in other places, we see that pride led him to his downfall and ultimately to be um, diminished and diseased at the end of his life. As a result of this, at this time period, we've seen the decline through Isaiah. Isaiah. The people are vulnerable to this sense of nostalgia. They're vulnerable to this sense of, hey, let's make Israel great again. Let's get back to where we were. 
when we were powerful and we had a strong king and and things were going well. Well, anyway, let's continue with Isaiah's vi vision here. It says seraph stood over them. Each had, each one had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, just like we sang a moment, moment ago. And they used the remaining two to fly. They called out to the one to one another, "Holy, holy, holy!" is the Lord of heaven's armies. His majestic splendor fills the entire earth. The sound of their voices shook the door frames and the temple was filled with smoke. I said, woe to me, I am destroyed for my lips are contaminated by sin and I live among people whose lips are contaminated by sin. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. But then one of the seraphs, and seraphs here literally means fiery ones, flew towards me. His hand, in his hand was a hot coal he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, look, a coal has touched your lips. Your evil is removed. Your sin is forgiven. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, whom will I send? Who will go on our behalf? And I answered, here I am. Send me. Let's pause here for a minute. The immediacy and the enthusiasm of Isaiah's positive response is rather unique when we compare it with several, several other instances where people encountered God or angels or received some kind of callings. Think of Jeremiah's hesitancy and Moses' stammering and Jonah's flight out to sea. For Isaiah, there's no hesitation. There's no excuse. There's no contingencies, no what-ifs. And, it, and if this shows a marked contrast with other prophets and leaders, it also shows a stark contrast with how the general public, how Israel is going to receive the message. Well, let's go on. He said, this is God speaking. Go and tell the people, listen continually, but don't understand. Look continually, but don't perceive. Make the hearts of these people callous and make their ears deaf, their eyes blind. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Their hearts might understand and they might repent and be healed. Century later, centuries later, Jesus would quote these very words as to how most people would receive his words. Isaiah replies, how long, Lord? He said, until the cities are in ruins and unpopulated and houses are uninhabited and the land is ruined and devastated. And the Lord had sent the people off to a distant place and every heart of the land and the very heart of the land is completely abandoned. He's talking about the, the captivity to come 140 years in the future. Even if only a tenth of the people remain in the land, it will again be destroyed like one of the large sacred trees or an asteroid pole. When a sacred pillar is on a high place is thrown down, the sacred pillars symbolize the special chosen family. You know, I wonder if Isaiah immediately regretted raising his hand and offering to go when he heard the message he had to preach. Uh, I can't tell you how many mission conferences I've attended over the years, how many mission Sunday services that I've heard that use Isaiah 6, at least the first half. The part that stops with, here I am, send me. And then they fail to go into the message that is to be preached and the response that it is to get. You see, responding to God's call in our life often leads us into situations that turn out very differently than we initially imagined. But we have to remember, this is God's deal. It's not ours that we're being invited into. This is not, hey, I'll respond, God, so that you will do what I think you should do. No, this is, okay, God, what do you want with that? So often we think saying yes to Jesus means we're, we, that we're going to be the hero. We're going to be the one that finally fixes the thing. We're going to be the, the one that finally brings about the justice. We're going to be the one that finally does the thing. And oftentimes, nothing of the sort transpires. We think that Jesus is going to sweep in and vindicate and affirm all our preferences and assumptions. 
when instead it ends up that those are the very things that usually get done away with, taken apart. <sighs> Dear me. I wonder if Isaiah repented after he heard the message from saying yes. Well, so how are we to respond to the situations we find ourselves in as a result of saying yes to Jesus? Saying yes to pledging all our affections, allegiances, and associations to God and to God's kingdom. Well, let's drill down for a minute on what God is doing and what the human response is, other than Isaiah's, that is. Like, like what is the people's response, not Isaiah's response? We've looked at that. What does it mean that God is going to restore, redeem, almost in spite of people's response? Not because they repent, but almost in spite of their lack of repentance. What does this, what does this mean? We're going to see in the coming chapters, in overwhelming depth and repetition, what it means when God talks about people closing their eyes and shutting their ears. They close their ears, they close their eyes with what are called enabling lies. We talked a lot about this this week, and there's a reference in the learning guide that takes you to an article that explains this more in depth. Enabling lies are lies that say our zealousness will save us. That as long as we follow the popular religious formula, chant the Christianese cliche of the day, that we'll be okay. The lie that says we don't have to name the offense that surrounds us because we may not have been directly involved in us. And those like, heavens, no, I would never do that thing. So we dismiss it altogether. We don't even name it. The lie that says our obedience to God is best served by just gathering more information, another Bible study another book, another seminar. It's best enabled by building a, a, a taller wall around us, further isolating ourselves into our own little cultural clique. The lie that says it's okay to cling to the nostalgic notion of some more perfect past where we were unchallenged in our assumptions of reality. When our underlying foundation is performative religion, when the pressure comes, we just, we just perform more. We just make a bigger flag, build a higher wall, sing the sound, song louder, all things that are clogging our ears, blinding our eyes. And if these are the enabling lies, what's the enabling truth? Well, the truth is that it is God who is going to bring about justice, that God is the one who is going to restore all things, that God is not deaf to the cries of the oppressed and the outcast, that God is not blind to the suffering of the marginalized, the murdered, and the manhandled, that God is cognizant and compassionate to all who are lonely, left out, lost, afraid, and afflicted. This is the truth that allows us to say with fear and trembling, but to say, yes, here we are, God. Send us. We're not the heroes of the story. We're not the ones who are going to do it, but we are responding to the God who is going to do these things, who will do what God says God will do. This allows us to go as messengers and witnesses to the truth, as ambassadors of reconciliation, as standard bearers of the kingdom of God, as practitioners of the better way, and proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus that says the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. This leads us not more to more performance, but it leads us to repentance not more superiority in certainty, but in humble faith, not in more hoarding, but in sacrificial sharing, not in excluding, but in radical hospitality, and not in self-righteous violence, but in deep shalom. 
Sorry, I'm going to start preaching there. Well, so how does this fit into what we do as a church? Well, we talk here about belong, become, believe, and we, we, we beat this drum every Sunday because it's who we are. We welcome others into the full fellowship of the church as a holy act, not based on their righteousness or our own righteousness, but the righteousness of God. This is the root of radical hospitality. As we participate with God in this, we start to reflect more and more the image of God. We become more like God. This experience of transformation, the promise of it, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when it doesn't work the way we think it should work, even when it offends us or confuses us, well, that forms our confession, our belief with that. Wendell Berry wrote in one of his poems, we live the given life, not the planned. I'm sure Isaiah experienced that. And so did the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who we remember this weekend and tomorrow. You see, well before the March on Washington or his famous I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King heard the invitation of God as well. Came just past midnight in the kitchen of his parsonage at 309 South Jackson Street, Montgomery, Alabama. And unlike the temple experience of Isaiah with angels and fire and smoke, Dr. King was surrounded by dishes and seated at an ordinary kitchen table. The only thing smoking was the steam off his cup of coffee. Dr. King was 27 years old. Think about this, 27 years old. Just two years into his role as the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He just recently stepped in to lead the Montgomery bus boycott. And this decision opened the floodgates of death threats by letter and by phone, sometimes as many as 30 or 40 calls a day, most of them at night. Dr. King would usually just put the phone back down and go back to sleep. But on the night of January 27, 1956, he was shook as his wife and 10-week-old daughter slept nearby. The caller on the other end of the line called him what we all know. And he said, we're tired of your mess. And if you aren't out of this town in three days, we're going to blow up your house and blow your brains out. Well, Dr. King couldn't shake off those words that night. The hatred in the threat, the specificity of it. He made his way to the kitchen, poured a cup of coffee, put his head in his hands, and out loud he prayed, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right, but I must confess, I'm losing courage. He later described what happened next. He said, I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for truth, stand up for justice, stand up for righteousness. Well, this was his call, one of many, but this specifically was the call that kept him going. It was his invitation. It was his Isaiah moment. But it didn't stop the threats. And because he refused to back down, several days later, they did blow they did set a bomb, it went off on the steps of his house. Now, at that point, no one was hurt in that, but they followed through on what they threatened. And even though he was leading this bus boycott, we look back on the great works that he did through his life, that all the standing up for justice, calling out white supremacy, most people don't know that Dr. King didn't ride buses. He was privileged for a black man of that era. As a respected pastor, he was well provided for. He could have stayed safe, driven his own car wherever he needed to go, made sure his family didn't have bombs planted on their front porch. He could have stayed well provided for if he had kept quiet on these things. 
Well, thank God he didn't. Thank God he didn't believe the enabling lies that perpetuate injustice. What about us? C.S. Lewis once wrote, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life, the life that God is sending day by day. Angels in the temple or a quiet inner voice over a cup of coffee in the kitchen, all of us are being invited to respond to God's call, not as the hero of the story, but as witnesses and messengers. The question is still being asked. Who will go? Part of our response to saying yes to Jesus is to come to his table. A huge part of saying yes is to receive. This lays aside, helps lay aside all the presumptions that we're going to be the hero, that this is going to be accomplished by our efforts, our talent, our truth. It's God's truth, God's talent, God's power that is doing all these things. We're just invited to participate to bear witness, to be messengers of it. And so we do that by remembering what Jesus told us to remember. When he was with his disciples that last night, when he took the bread and he broke it, he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Take and eat. So we start our yes by receiving not by doing, but by having something done for us. Likewise, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sin. So again, we come not because we've done something or we've become perfect, but, but because what's been done for us. And this act of receiving is where our witness starts. So take, eat, and drink. Oh, God, be my everything. Be my delight. Be Jesus, my my soul satisfied, oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus, my glory, my soul satisfied, be thou my Thank you.
Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Jeff. I want to invite everyone again, jump on the Zoom link just to hang out after the service, uh, check in on everybody, see how everyone's doing. Um, thank you for making the time to be here this morning. Thank you for making the time to listen to this. And here's our benediction. Grace Church, go now with a heart and mind willing to walk as you have been called to accept the challenges and difficulties that are set before you, be strengthened and sustained. May God help you to find assurance, rest, and affirmation in God alone and in all you do. In the name of the Creator God, the Messiah, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. Grace and peace, y'all.